again to another Whispering Hope Daily Sabbath School Lesson Study. And here with, to help us this morning with our lesson study, we have Elder Stacy Maskell, Elder Vaughn Joseph, and assisting them today as well is Elder Ronald Thomas. We're happy to have them. Elders, good morning. Morning. Good 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 morning. So we're going to go into a study, but before we get into a study, well, the Lord is going to read for us this week, and we're going to switch over to Brother Thomas. Brother Thomas, you'll say a prayer for us. Okay, our memory text this week comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4, verse 29. I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, but from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for your blessings again this morning. We want to thank you, God, that you're so near to us. And as we seek your face, you have promised that you will reveal yourself to us. Even now, as the choices that we might have to make today, we pray that you might reveal yourself to the answers and point us in the direction that we need to go. And we thank you for all your blessings and all your mercies upon us today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so we're talking about today's lesson. We're talking about seek me and find me. But I have to define some words before I get into the study today. And I'm going to ask Elder Vaughan, Elder Master, let me go with Elder, Elder Master. What is foreknowledge? And why is it important to understand what it means based on the discussion that we're having this morning? Yes, good morning to the audience. And certainly we need to define because based on the lesson study, Seek Me and Find Me, we are introduced to the fact that God has foreknowledge. And so foreknowledge is when you know beforehand, you know everything that is going to happen in the future before it even happens. And that's the God we serve. You know, sometimes we as individuals, we try to predict and anticipate things, but we serve a God that before we even came forth out of our mother's womb, he knew us. And so that is God, he's omniscient. He is all knowing because Revelation says he's the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. So God knows everything. And so foreknowledge is really a characteristic of God because he knows beforehand what is going to happen. I'm going to come back and ask you one of the telling questions people ask all the time about if God knows everything, then why do we have to tell him some things? But I'm going to go to Elder Vaughan now. Elder Vaughan, this is a discussion all over the place, and it seems to be dividing the church. What is free choice, and who did God give it to? What is free choice, free will, and who did God give this to? What is free choice? Free will, you use those terms interchangeably. Free choice is the God-given choice that God gave to us to have the option to either choose A or B or C or D or to go left or right or to choose to serve or not to serve, to follow Christ or not to follow Christ. God gave us that free will. And why? I'm going to say why first, then I'm going to say who. Why did he give us free choice? We learned that out here in the lessons past, that God is love. And in the Godhead, in the triune Godhead, there is love. And God wanted to extend that love to mankind. And so he created us in order for us to share in the beautifulness of what he has created and to be able to engage him and to love him and to reciprocate to him and for him to love us and we can have that wonderful loving relationship. But we are hardwired or programmed or just made this way that we can only love then it is not love because we haven't chosen to do so. And so God gave us choice so that we can choose to love him. And so therefore, let me just put a scenario. If I was to stick a gun to my wife's head before we were married and I said, well, you better marry to me or else I'm blowing your head off. She was to say, okay, I'll marry you. He gave all mankind freedom of choice. We are free human beings to choose. But as we looked at the thing last week, God says to choose life, 
because he knows what's best for us. Because if we don't choose the giver of life, then we're choosing not to be in his, we're not in his stead. We are outside of his ambit. And therefore, if we haven't chosen him, then we're choosing death by natural consequences. So, Elder, that's my response to your question. Elder Thomas, could you read for us Deuteronomy chapter 4? Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 25 to 28. All right, it says from the King James Version, When thou shalt beget children and children's children, and ye shall have remained long in the land, and shall corrupt yourselves and make a graven image, or the likeness of anything that shall do evil in the sight of the Lord thy God, to provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day, that he shall soon utterly perish from off the land, whereon to ye go over Jordan to possess it. Ye shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall utterly be destroyed. 27. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and ye shall be left few in number among the heathens, whither the Lord shall lead you. And there ye shall serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. 29. But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Okay, I went ahead of me there, what, 28. Um, Elder, what did the Lord say that the people would do after they entered into the promised land? It's interesting that God had said to them through Moses how they should live in the promised land. But here God is already saying that I know that you're going to do different than what I said. And so he's, he's speaking as if this is something that they have already done. He's speaking from that perspective. You go over there and you make graven image and these things that I had said to you before not to do. This is what is going to happen to you. You're going to suffer the consequences of these actions as you turn away from me. But nonetheless, he then gives the, the comfort of knowing that you can return. There is a place where you can return. If then, after you do these things and, uh, and I, I punish you or, or I meet out judgment upon you and you turn back to me again with your whole heart, you will find me. I will be there for you. So it's, it's comforting, I think, to know that even though God knows us more than we know ourselves, yet still he makes provision, even if we go straight, that he will be able to re reinstate us into a right relationship with him. Okay. Elder Juan, I'm back to you before I go to uh, Elder Stacy. If God knows, and he knows what I'm going to do, that he's saying to me, look, you're going to go into the land of promise, when you go into the land of promise, you're going to worship false gods. But he knows that. So why would God do that, Elder Vaughan? Why would God, uh, he knew, and that's what a question some people are asking, why did, and they're saying, this is the reason why I'm not a Christian, or I don't subscribe or subscribe to this God King. Because if he know that we're going to do something, why did he make us? Why did he put us in a position that we'll do what we we end up doing, and he knew that we would have done. Yes, God has foreknowledge. God knows the future. It's evident from the word of God that he knows the future. He knows what is going to take place. He knows what actions we're going to take and how we're going to behave, how we're going to react. God knows all that. Otherwise, he wouldn't be God. He would be guessing. He would be just like all of us, trying to figure out what the future holds. But God holds the future in his hands, so he knows what's happening. So, Elder, he knows. That's what the point I'm making. So why, why say to me? So, so, <laughs> here's the point. God knows. But that has nothing. The fact that God knows, he has nothing to do with your choice. You see what I'm saying? God knows whether you're going to choose right or wrong. God loves us so much. And this is the point. God loves us. To go ahead and make mankind in his own image, knowing fully well that man is going to sin. 
then what would God do? I mean, I can't think in the mind of God. What would God do? Say, well, I'm not going to make any one of them. I'm not going to make anything. I'm not going to make anybody. I'm not going to make any human beings. I'm just going to just continue living me, God, and the Holy Spirit. And that's it. We're fine. But because God wants to share so much with, with a race, with a creation, to, to, to express the love of the triune God to all mankind, he decided to make us nonetheless, knowing that we would go astray. But even though when we go astray, God already had a plan in place. Again, it shows the deep love of Christ for his creation. He had a plan in place that when they sin, I am going to make and bridge the gap for them. They can, have, they can still have eternal life because God wants to spend eternity with us. He wants us to spend it with him. That's how far reaching the love of God is that we can't fathom and understand fully. But I know this much. That God, knowing that man was going to sin, he also knew and put in place a remedy for when man would have sinned, that man can spend eternity with him. They can come back to him and he can have his creation in eternity with him, irrespective of the fact that others would choose otherwise. And so that is, I don't know if you want to call it the risk that God would take, but God is not a risk taker. God knew what was going to happen. And so I see it, Elder, to all those who are listening out there, as God's deep, unfathomable love for us, that he went and made us nonetheless when he knew we were going to sin. When he knew the people of ch children of Israel were going to go into the promised land and they were going to go to false gods and so on. God still went along with it because that is the depth and height of God's love for mankind. We're going to be on this topic for a while because we're talking about seeking him and finding him, but... We're not to that part yet. We're just discussing the whole aspect of choice. And so we're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 4, 15 to 20. Chapter 4, 15 to 20. Take ye therefore good heed unto yourself, for ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire. Lest ye corrupt yourself and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth, and lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God had divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. But the Lord had taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance, as ye are this day. So here is God, Elder Master, telling them, look, I know this is what you're going to do. So why did he take them out of Egypt? What exactly is happening here, Sister Master? So here we see a story where God went down to Egypt. He sent Moses into Egypt to get his people out of bondage because they were in there for over 400 mm -hmm. years. And so he was determined that he was going to bring them back to him where he could demonstrate, where they could offer worship to him and he could have communion with them. And so even though they were bought out of Egypt, some of them still had Egypt in them. And they, they, they suffered in the, um, the wilderness, not because God wanted them, but it was a choice, as Brother Vaughn would have demonstrated or illustrated in his um, deliberations, that we have free will. And so they got caught up in idolatry. And this was forewarning that they should have observed that God was anticipating they would do. Now, Brother Joe, I would have been on this earth for over 40 years. I do have four children. And I would have been able to look and see examples of children going astray. And I would have still made a decision to go and have children. Now, I'm at the place where I have children who are now crossing over into adulthood who have crossed over and who are still looking to cross over i'm actually having nightmares brother joseph to tell the honest truth because sometimes when you think you are advising as a parent don't do so 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 you thought when they were little you had you know a ball of a time trying to get them to sit down and stay still but i realized now that those were the easy days 
it is during these periods that as you want, as they come more bold face in making decisions for themselves, that the trying times come. And so I just thought when I was looking at the lesson, I just thought of myself thinking of how God I can't really put myself in God's shoe because we have done so much as humanity to God. You, you understand? God is saying to me, I, I love you. According to, I have a verse here that I want to share with our audience this morning, not to prolong it, but, but this is serious. What question that you have asked, according to Acts chapter three, verse 19, it says, God is saying to us, repent therefore and turn again that your sins may be blotted out. God wants us for himself, as brother Vaughn would have said, they were their Trinity, father, son, Holy ghost. And they said, let us, let us make mankind, let us make man. And it's because of his love, unconditional love that God made us and continue to pursue us. And he will never stop pursuing us. And there's so many um, illustrations in the Bible which point us back to cases where even though the children of Israel were so horrible, he still went back for them and took them unto himself. And that is what he wants to do for mankind. Because of love, he keeps pursuing us, Brother Joe. I thought for a moment <laughs> about being a parent and how relevant, I've never heard that before, but I, how relevant they are up. The imagery that you brought made sense. And you know how we teach our children so many things and we tell them not to, don't do this. This is not the wise thing to do based on whatever. And then, yes, it really took me a thinking a while ago as a parent myself. Um, so, Elder Thomas, your thoughts on that, that particular topic. You, uh, do you concur with Elder Vaughn and Elder Maskell that God has a plan why he says to us to not to, to do something that he already knows that we're going to be doing. I share the same sentiment. When we really consider who God is, one of the things that we've realized about God is that God is in control of everything. And even though he set boundaries, he would have set boundaries, yet still within the confines of these boundaries, he gave us freedom to operate. And, and so that free will, God does not stop us from operating within these boundaries. He has already showed what is good and what is evil. And he says to us, he didn't leave us just to choose which one we think is right and what we think is wrong. So he gave us clearly what is right and what is wrong. But he left us to make those choices as to whether or not we want to have life in him or we don't because ultimately at the very end of what we're looking at in terms of humanity is that there is everlasting life for people who would desire to have that intimate relationship with God and so what God would have done is that he would have given every human being the opportunity to choose whether or not they would want to be a part of his kingdom, a part of his eternal kingdom or not. And so he knows that, that yes, human beings are going to go astray. He has, he has still gone ahead to make provision so that even when we go astray, we can come back again. And it really points, as Brother Vaughan Elevon was saying, to the love of God. Because can you imagine that after all of this, nobody will have an excuse to say that God was unfair and they didn't get a chance to have eternal life. God would have made all the provisions. And at the end of the day, is God saying that, hey, when the end of this thing comes, I know for certain that these people who choose life will never again want or desire evil. They have had the, the, the opportunity to deal with evil and they had rejected it. So never again will they. And that's why the Bible says that, you know, iniquity will not rise up the second time. Because, of course, those who would have chosen in this, chosen in this life to go along with God and to live in accordance with God's will will never again choose evil. And so that's, that's where the free will and what God has done is such an act of love so that we are all given that opportunity to choose whether we want to live or whether we want to die. 
Elder Ward, I, I have a question I want to ask you, but I'm going to ask you the question that I have written now that I'm supposed to ask you. I hope that I have enough time to ask you that question. You in particular. <laughs> Juta, let us go to Juta, what chapter 429 to 31, Elder Ward. Yes. The word of God says, but if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him. If thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul, when thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God and shalt be obedient unto his voice, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God, he will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he swear unto them. Elder Vaughan, what does the Lord say he will do for them in this specific situation? And while you're on it, I'm going to ask you the question. Why would I have to seek the Lord to find him when he knows everything? Okay, so God is saying that he will basically not turn away from them. He will actually elevate them. He will lift them up. He will embrace them. He will accept them once again. When they would have, after a period of time, turned their hearts slowly away from him, I guess that's why we call it or term it backsliding. It's a slow, imperceptible move away from God. You turn from me and you worship these gods and you make graven images and you do all these things. If you turn back to me, I will embrace you and accept you. If you repent of your sin, if you, if, if you recognize that you've done wrong and you come to me with a penitent heart and a true heart and you say, God, you know, I am so sorry. I realize what I've done. I've hurt you. I've gone against you. God says he's going to embrace you. And that again, that shows a love that we can't fully understand. God loves us so much that we can do all manner of evil. But when we come to our senses, like the prodigal son, and we turn around and we return to God, God is right there to accept us and to embrace us. And he said he will be merciful. He says he's a merciful God. All right. And he would not forget the covenant that he made with their fathers. And then you ask another question, Elder. Why is he asking us? We are talking about seek me and find me. Why would he want me to go and find him when I'm already in my rebellious state and he knows everything about me? Why doesn't he come and get me? If you had your child who was out there and you couldn't find him for a few days and somebody tell him he's somewhere where he's not supposed to be, but you try to go and get him, why would he come and seek me out when he... I, I, explain to me. <laughs> All right, Elder. Okay, no problem. God is always, God is always seeking. God is always there. His voice is always speaking. Whether it's to direct revelation, to His Word, to a friend, to a companion, to He's saying here, and this is a very personal thing. It is not necessarily. Yes, He's speaking to the children of Israel as a group of people, as a nation. But he's speaking individually. I think we look at last week where the, the actual grammar is speaking of an individual point of speech that he's speaking to the children of Israel. God is saying, finding him doesn't mean as if you're looking for somebody who's lost. No, 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 no. It is saying that you come to the understanding and to the hearing, the acknowledging of God's voice speaking towards you. In this particular instance, the children of Israel, they... I think maybe tomorrow's lesson is always a return to God, a return to God, to where you were before. That's what I said before, that people have backslide, backslidden, they have gone away from God, but God wanted to return. It's, a, it's, a, it's another case where individuals have never known the Lord, and they're coming to him for the first time. But God is speaking here to, the, to his chosen people, the children, to return to him, because you would have known him before. And so God is not saying to go and find me in terms of you have to go to jump to some hoops or go to some great pilgrimage or, or beat yourself or whatever to find him. God is saying, just stop and listen because I'm speaking. Remember what I taught you before. God is saying, listen to the still small voice, not a thunderous earthquake and lightning and thunder. But God is saying, listen to me. I'm still speaking. Hear me when I speak and turn back towards me. And so Elder is not, people out there watching, is not a case where you have to go do some great thing to go and find the God, as if God is under a rock somewhere. But God is saying, relax, listen, 
Listen to my voice speaking to the world, to a friend, to a colleague, to a church member, to your neighbor, to direct revelation. And when you hear the voice, remember and return to the God of your salvation. So that puts it in a little different perspective there. It's about a response to God's constant pleading. And so um, I'm happy for that clarification this morning. God's grace is amazing. Even after we walk into sin, and sometimes the most horrific evil, but Elder, I was saying, some of us don't walk into sin, some of us run into sin. And sometimes the most horrific evil of idolatry, God still loves us and wants to save us. Why? That's my question to all three of you. We, I go headlong, um, as the old people would say, I'm Elder Vaughan, full speed ahead and people are cautioning me. Elder, we are going. You know better. You used to preach to people. And I go headlong into sin. God is still seeking after me. And why? Some time ago, I thought about this idea of, of who God is in terms of his ability to create and to make stuff and, and to give life to it. An illustration came to me in that I have a brother who used to do a little craft work. And, you know, there are some people who can do some great carving. And, and I was saying, if I could have done something like that and I would carve something out of wood and, and could give it some kind of means of life or something to see it operate and to see it work for whatever purpose I would craft it for, there is something about it that would not want me to destroy it. And so regardless to what happened to it, how much it would not do something or it would be dysfunctional for one reason or the other, I would do my best to fix it because I made it and I made it for a purpose. And as long as it's not doing the purpose to which I made it, I would try to fix it. So I think from that perspective, I kind of get the fact that because God made us for a purpose, regardless of what happened, God is trying to fix us because he wants us to fulfill the purpose to which he has made us. And, and it, it shows the depth of God love and it shows that he didn't just create us because he didn't have anything to do. And so he just decided, let me just make these people and, and then leave them and whatever they do, they do. No, he created us for a purpose to bring glory to his name, to add in terms of his kingdom and all of that. And so it doesn't matter how much we go straight, God still tries to fix us, to bring us back into that line that he had made us for his purpose and for his glory. And, and the other thing about God's love and, and the area of choice that I see that God gives us is that in fact, that once we choose to do what God desire that we should do, then we're operating in a way that, that it, it's, it's life, it's giving us life. If we choose otherwise, it's death. When we turn away from God, we become lost. We don't stay at one place when we turn away. We go away from God. So when God said to seek me and find me, with, as, as Elevon is saying, he's speaking to us continually. But there must be a desire to get back to God. And there's a journey to get back to God. Even though God would take us back right away, our characters would have been defected. And in order to build back that character, we must then channel back. It's a process that gets us back to that place with God. So that, yes, when we accept God and we turn around and we repent, God save us, right, we're saved right away. But the relationship that we should have with God, because we went a distance away from him, we have to make that journey back into that relationship with him. And so it's a seeking, it, it shows that we are desirous of having a relationship with God. So it, it comes like a journey. Seek me and you will find me. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Except you're hungry, you don't want to eat, right? So, so you have to be in that position where you find that God is really necessary and your desire is to have that relationship with God. And just to add quickly, because I think Brother Thomas would have captured it perfectly in terms of his analogy as well, and to suggest that, you know, God has not done anything wrong. We're the one who have done everything wrong. And he wants to bring us back to a place where he can give us what he intended to, which is life and life abundantly. 
and and brother thomas would have also drawn the analogy from a craftsman but i want to draw it from a parent that parent plug i've been making because many of us have children and as good parents, we would want the best for our children, no matter what they have done. And we would work, especially uh, within our culture of Caribbean people, we want to work and make sure we leave a little something for our children. So when they come, they don't have it as hard as maybe what we would have. And so we'll make many sacrifices. And sometime along the way, you find these children are so, as, as they term it, ungrateful, they're not concerned. And some of them, when we give them, they squander it. But at the end of the day, they're still our children. We still love them and we still want the best for them. And we are frail humans. We can only offer them an imper in this imperfect world. But God has perfection that he wants to give us. And so with that, he keeps pursuing us so that we can have that dialogue with him and enter into that relationship with him so that he can give us what he plans for us, which is splendor. And I can't even add any more adjectives because I'll be limited in terms of words. Elder Vaughan. And Elder, just to reiterate again, and Elder Thomas um, quite aptly uh, responded and as well as Elder Maskell, just to repeat, God loves us with an everlasting love. And that is not a trivial matter. That is everlasting love. Once we are ready to return to God, no matter what we have done, no matter how heinous the crime may be, honestly, because God knows the heart. Once we return to God, ask for forgiveness, repent of our sins, God is going to be right there, ready to accept us. It's it's not a matter of when we repent, then God say, okay, I love you now. Because God loves us all the time. God's love is permanent. And so here it is that whatever we do, God's love is still there. God wants to save us. He wants us to be in a saving relationship with him. And so it's only mankind that keep people's bad habits and bad things and jail sentences and all their crime on record and hold it against them even if the person wants to change and decide to change but god thank god god is not like man god loves us irrespective of what we do meaning that he loves us god is going to be crying even when we have been burned in hellfire because god wants us to spend eternity with him we are his creation he made us god loves us and that is something that we need to all understand now let, let hence let me just say this quickly elder for me being misunderstood today. <clears throat> it doesn't mean out there individuals that you do all manner of evil and expect that you are going to be received into heaven, into God's relationship. God wants you to choose him. And when you choose God, those things that are contrary to God's will and contrary to God's nature, let his spirit live within you. And so I don't want to be misunderstood this morning that you can do all manner of evil and just live your life carelessly. But God wants, God loves us. He loves the sinner because all of us are sinners. In 30 seconds, because we are already over time, 30 seconds each person, what was your takeaway from today's lesson? Seek me, find me. But let me jump in quickly, Brother Joe. I'm happy that God is all-knowing. I'm also happy that he did not make me as a robot and programmed me, but he gave me free will. And I just want to bid those who are listening to us this morning that they become repentant in heart and give God a chance because he only wants the best for us. He loves us unconditionally. Have a good morning. All right, I'll say, Elder, God loves us. God loves us so much. That as human beings, sometimes we cannot understand it. But just know the fact that God is there, right there, even now, in this rough period that people are going through. God is right there. And he is seeing everything that's going on. And God loves you. He wants to save you. And even though this world may throw um, obstacles at you, and so just hold on, my brother, hold on, my sister. God will see you through no matter what you're going through. And Thomas, 30 seconds. Yes, I, I, you know, I just want to say that despite of what people might say about you, what you would, would not be able to achieve or where you might not be able to go, if you don't do this and if you don't do that, you can't get this and you can't get that. God is saying that if you seek me with all your heart, you will find me.
it just tells me that God is very near and that if nothing else is real, what God says is true. You see God, you will find him. Absolutely, absolutely. There we have it, my friends. Seek God this morning because God is right there in your very presence trying to get your attention to let you know you do not have to travel far. Just turn, look, and live. May you give your hearts to Jesus today. God bless you and have a wonderful day.